I'm Heather Dahl, I'm CEO of Indicia Tech, and joining me today is uh, Chase Cunningham, uh, Dr. Zero Trust. And I apologize in advance for this view of my slide deck. However, I'm having challenges sharing the full screen. So in the spirit of getting through the pandemic together and digital events, I hope all will um, appreciate the circumstance we're in and uh, just kind of support us here through this screen share. So uh, Chase and I are here to talk with you about how decentralized identity, verifiable credentials, and zero trust security all work together in creating a new paradigm um, for trust and verification online. And so Chase and I will walk you through this concept together. We all have seen this uh, cartoon on the internet, no one knows you are a dog, but you know, the question is why is that? Why is it that no one knows whether you're a dog, a cat, or a human being? And that's because the internet was built without a way to know who you are and what you are connecting to. And so um, that is partly why we are in the circumstance that we're in, it's why Chase uh, stays very busy these days. And so we're here to talk with you about a way that we can build more trust into the internet and basically add that missing layer. For citizens and businesses, identity online means that you're in a constant state of vulnerability. Every time, whether you're online, whether that's your mobile device, a tablet, or your laptop, everyone's concerned around the fraud and compromises around our personal data that occurs. In fact, it's not just about the initial compromise and the initial breach. We also have a challenge with privacy because being online generates additional identity metadata about yourself, which is then aggregated, sold, and used in ways that render probably that prior consent that you gave in the privacy policy or terms of use is actually meaningless at that point. And so what we have come to use today and what uh, myself and Mike, who will be joining us, have been involved with is the creation, building, and now commercial implementation of decentralized identity. Decentralized identity is a transformational solution. It has been propelled significantly since the pandemic began. And it, what it does at its essence is enables zero trust identity. In fact, last week, the government of Ontario announced that it's going to be building a decentralized identity ecosystem to allow for people and businesses to prove who they are online and in person. It says that its government's goals is to make Ontario the most advanced digital jurisdiction in the world. But what we see is that Ontario is leading a whole slew of other governments and global enterprises who are already moving to adopt decentralized identity. It's estimated by the government of Ontario that such a digital identity system in their province is estimated to be worth $20 billion. In fact, when you look at the use of a verifiable credential, what's important to note is that a verifiable credential only shares the necessary information needed to perform a transaction, or in the case of zero trust, to verify who you are. It means that it's not too little information in order to make a decision, or that it contains information that's just not needed for the purpose of that transaction. So what I'm going to do is turn it over to Chase Cunningham to walk through the G zero trust component of this segment. Chase. Hey, thank you very much. So I'm going to talk about really security stuff because that's my thing, right? As I live, eat, sleep and breathe this. So this is this is my purview. I think this is super applicable. I'm a member of the Indicio node network. I run nodes there. I, I personally think that where we're going with uh, credentials and identity and security in total in this space is gravitating into this whole thing. So this is very good in my opinion. Now, what do we learn? We actually ask ourselves about thousands upon thousands of security breaches. Um, it's basically the same thing. Like we just rinse and repeat and then we call it something different and then it'll show up on the news as this new hack or blah, 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 or whatever. 
Really, it's not. Um, it's users, it's accounts, it's excessive privileges, it's excessive access, and it's the ability for bad guys to move between systems. All this stuff about AI and whatever else, like none of that's real. It doesn't necessarily exist in the way that they're talking about it. This is the problem. It, actually, I did the math on this, and every person on planet Earth has got about 30 accounts that they don't really need that would provide potential access for a system. If you don't believe me, ping me and I'll show you the mathematics on it because it's crazy. If you look at what's actually the problem, you can only control a piece of this equation, right? You can't stop bad guys from doing recon. You can't stop them from weaponizing things to do attacks. However, you can stop to some degree delivery. You can stop exploitation, installation, these other pieces of the puzzle. How do you do that? Well, you do that by having a really good identity and access management thing in place and de decentralized identity combined with these approaches and technologies does that. Like this is where we need to go to eliminate and minimize the risk from threats that are that are continuing to figure out ways to evolve. Let's go to the next slide. Right, that's what you're trying to get to. An adversary, in order for an adversary to win, and this is from a guy that was a red team where I worked at NSA, like I can tell you for an adversary to win, they have to continually keep access to a system. How do you keep access to a system? With an account, with the credential, with an access, with the privilege, those types of things. If you remove that, you win. There has never been a, in the history of exploitation, a firewall has never woke up and hacked itself. Some person somewhere found a way to get to it and did admin things and then modified it. So if we can change the game, if we can flip the paradigm and we can take the power away from the bad guy as far as their accounts, their access is excessive privileges, we win. Again, if you look at the life cycle, there's things you can't control and things you can. If we control the things that we should control, we gain ground and we win back the initiative. That's what we want. Next slide. Perimeter security period does not work. Do you know when the, the first instance of perimeter-based security actually failing was? Anybody ever heard of the city of Troy? What did we used to call malware? We called it Trojans, right? Because it got past the wall, the big wall around Troy, and then they were able to get in and burn the city to the ground. And that was back in like 1280 BC. So we've known for hundreds of years that this is not going to work. However, for some reason, we thought we could take a failed security paradigm that required access and make it digital. And all of a sudden we would fix the, the game like we would win. It doesn't work. People are still going to click things no matter what. Statistically speaking, three to six percent of people will continue to click phishing links even after you've trained them. I can tell you because I've been a red teamer. I've literally been to an organization the day after phishing training and I still got people. If I get you the right email with the right attachment, I'll get you. So just understand that we can't rely on people not to click things because that's what we're doing. We're sitting here right now clicking stuff to do our jobs. So it's ridiculous for us to try and think we cannot do that. This type of security paradigm doesn't work. Hackers get past systems right through one link. Now, the point going back here is they get in, but they don't need to stay in. Like we can live with them getting in probably, but we can't live with them continuing to get in. I can live with one tree burning in a forest. I cannot live with the entire forest on fire. That's what we don't want. It doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be difficult. We have to put things in place for the users that will make them more secure and will remove the power from the adversary. That's where this stuff starts to gain ground. Next slide. And look, COVID killed the perimeter. Like if there was ever an argument about we still had perimeter security and et cetera, et cetera, it is gone. It is dead. We have we have killed it. We have burned it. We have buried over the ashes. There's a parking garage on top of where the grave site was. Like it's it's done. 26% of the global workforce will never return to the office full time. 26%. One in four people will never go back to the office full time. What does that mean? More remote, more access, more accounts, more creds. 70% increase in the use of remote connectivity. More people are going in and out. More people are transiting. 76% increase in BYOD. No one wants you to give them a machine. They want to use their machine to do their work. There is an entire generation of people coming into the workforce now that don't even understand what it means to have a corporate issued, corporate formatted machine. They want to use their phone, their laptop. So you have to have capabilities in place that allow you to do this so that you can meet the needs of the new generation and do things right for people in the security context that we need. We are all way outside the perimeter right now. Like if we're lucky, we look like this slide where we're up on a hill and we can see where we need to be. However, between us and there, there's a lot of bad stuff. 
Luckily, if we eliminate the problems we have with credentialing, we eliminate a lot of that problem space. Next slide. And it's very simple. There's three simple principles. Verify explicitly, always use least privilege, and assume breach. If I can do those three things, I am enabling zero trust in some way, shape, or form. The beauty of a really good strategy is that there is no biblical reference for it. There's no one way that someone tells you how to be healthier, right? It's your health. You know how you get healthier. You know how you do things for you. It's the same thing for your business with a strategy like zero trust that evolves and that changes. Do those three things and you are working to enable zero trust in some way, shape or form. Next slide. And look, this is big. This is not just some guy sitting in a room talking about it. There were four publications this week from the Biden administration all about enabling zero trust for the federal government. 100% of the DOD has adopted zero trust as a long-term security strategy. 100% of them are not zero trust right now. They are adopting it and they are figuring out how to go there. OMB, NIST, et cetera, et cetera, name your governing body. All of them are publishing information and drafts around how to enable zero trust. 78% of organizations globally are moving to ZT, 13% of major financials, 14% of healthcare. Nine out of 10 people that you talk to in security will say that the perimeter-based model has categorically died. However, I would say if you asked them this morning, it'd probably be 100%. And there is a globally addressable market for this, which is very, very good. The TAM for ZT globally is about $40 billion. Now, that's an, that's an estimate I put in about two weeks ago. The last numbers I saw, it's about $52 billion. So more publications, more organizations gravitating towards this, the bigger ZT gets because zero trust makes a difference. Zero trust requires these things. And these technologies and these types of paradigms fit very well into ZT. Thank you, Chase. And what we're going to talk about now is how decentralized identity solves the PII and verification problem with zero trust um, security. As Chase talked about, if the perimeter is dead, how do you verify um, organizations or individuals trying to enter your system? And so I want to um, see if Mike Vesey has joined us. I know we've been having some technical difficulties. Then what I will do is I will present for Mike today. Um, zero, uh, decentralized identity replaces the current currency of identity. Um, PII with credentials are verified cryptographically through an immutable blockchain ledger. Oftentimes we talk about decentralized identity with three parties, the issuer, the holder, and the verifier. The issuer, um, gives the verifiable credential based upon some type of KYC that that issuer follows. The holder then has the ability to keep the verifiable credential either in their mobile device or in what can be called a cloud wallet or even a custodial wallet in the case of guardianship. That verifiable credential and the data behind it is secured with uh, cryptographic keys and signature. And therefore, when the holder goes to present to the verifier in order to provide some information about a claim a person is making them to themselves, the verifier can actually go to the ledger to help verify the cryptography used behind that, in addition, the schema in which the data is presented. So it's this combination of the holder, issuer, and verifier that creates decentralized identity. The key here is that the data is not held in a centralized database. The data is decentralized through the holders of the verifiable credentials. Oftentimes we think about identity as something that is assigned to an individual, but in the case of decentralized identity, it can be a thing, it can be a business, it can be even uh, um, in the case of uh, agriculture, livestock, um, animals. So anything out there, even a process, a document, a receipt can have its own unique identity. Verifiable credentials, and while we talk about this may sound futuristic, it's actually not. Um, verifiable credentials are being deployed by global inter 
enterprises. And that's often been spurred by COVID and travel restrictions. In the case here, you can see a decentralized identity um, travel app that was developed by CETA, uh, the aviation technology provider. In this case, there is uh, as a result of a trial on the island of Aruba where a traveler was able to take a COVID PCR test at the airport that was provided by the hospital in Aruba. They received their medical record by using verifiable credentials. The traveler then received the results of their test while they were quarantined in their hotel room and provided just the information that the government of Aruba needed to make a decision whether that traveler met the requirements for a happy travel pass. Once issued, that happy travel pass was then used by the travelers to enter high risk venues, such as casinos, nightclubs, and museums. And they were able to verify that they met the government healthcare requirements to the venue, but did not have to reveal any of the medical data that was used by the government to make that district distinction. And so it preserved the traveler's privacy while providing trust to the um, verifying organization. In the case of decentralized identity, it's a flexible technology that can meet the need across a variety of industries, from education to utilities, as we talked about, from travel and banking, healthcare, supply chains. It's truly a global and portable um, technology. And it's supported by identity standards held within the W3C, the Decentralized Identity Foundation, and through open source projects like Hyperledger, Indie, Aries, and URSA. There are some obstacles and misunderstandings when it comes to adoption of decentralized identity. Many still believe this is only a concept and actually and not a product. However, today there are products available for commercial implementation. There are mature open source code bases in which to build upon. An organization can deploy decentralized identity today. This is not a concept anymore. The terminology can be confusing, decentralized, centralized, identity. Um, oftentimes the terminology can be confusing to those who are new in the space. Also, data privacy laws are not necessarily written to account for the most recent innovations in the blockchain identity space. And therefore the laws are written for identity techniques and concepts that are a few years old and haven't acknowledged the advancements we have made in this space. And lastly, we see organizations who confuse the um, environmental impact um, for the energy consumption that's being used in crypto. Because there is no proof of work, decentralized identity actually takes a very little amount of energy consumption. In fact, it's the equivalent of looking up a web page. And so to talk about the outlook for six months to a year, what we're seeing is the adoption of travel and border management for COVID testing. We see passwordless login as an urgent issue to deal with, especially with zero trust architectures. And we see rapid adoption in this space. And also it'll be interesting to follow governments that look at the Ontario decision and decide to adopt decentralized identity for their own um, infrastructures. So in the, in the near term, IoT, smart city management is a perfect situation for the use of a verifiable credential in sharing data between the, um, the devices. So in summary, Decentralized identity, we see as me, means the end of passwords um, and account management. In fact, when you think about any kind of delightful digital experience that you've had in the past 15 months, I suspect it will be hard to count very many. And oftentimes it starts with the username and password. Decentralized identity brings the world of passwords and account logins to an end and enables the continuous verification needed by zero trust.